اهلا وسهلا يا مرحبا اتمنى اني سعود جود افترنون اند ويلكم تو ذا سيشن ويتش از ديفلوبد جوينتلي بين ذا وورلد ايكونوميك فورم اند العربيه نيوز شانل Let me introduce myself first. My name is Nadine Hani, and I present the business news on Al Arabiya News Channel. And it is such a pleasure and honor to be here again with you, meeting face to face after two very tough years. And thank you for being here for this session, which will discuss the economic outlook for the MENA region. Uh, before we start the conversation, I'd like to note that this session is being live streamed as we speak now on all the social media platforms of Arabia News Channel, and a part of it will be broadcasted live during the conversation. So for years, the MENA region had been struggling with its own set of problems rel relating to high levels of unemployment, especially among the youth, lack of inclusive growth, as well as political instability in many of its countries. As we meet today, the level of challenges has increased dramatically, especially for commodity importers in the MENA region, from inflation levels that are widening deficits and plunging more and more people into poverty, to already high debt levels vulnerable to the aggressive expected rise in interest rates, in addition to supply chain issues and food shortages resulting from the war in Ukraine. So how does the outlook look like and what are the different countries doing to minimize that impact and harness the growth potential of the young populations of the MENA region? To discuss those issues, I have the pleasure of introducing an esteemed lineup of speakers. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Al Jadan, Minister of Finance of Saudi Arabia. His Excellency Mr. Salman bin Khalifa Al Khalifa, Minister of Finance and National Economy of Bahrain. Mr. Mohammed Al Ardi, Executive Chairman of Invest Corp from Bahrain. And Mr. Alain Bajani, CEO of Majid Al Futem from the UAE. Your Excellencies, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, our time is tight, but we are going to try to take a couple of questions from the audience so you can start preparing your questions. Your Excellency, let me start with you. I'd like you to take a couple of minutes to give us your outlook on the MENA region in general. Keep it concise because also we want to hear about Saudi Arabia. Well, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Nadine. And I would like to thank WUF, and it's good to be back after two years uh, in person. Uh, MENA, just so that we are clear, MENA, while we share a lot of common um, features, is actually a very diverse also. So what um, might fit um, uh, uh, in one country, what challenges faces one country may not be the same as others. So let us just be careful not to take MENA um, as it a one, one block. As a one block. Huh? That said, there is actually a lot of common um, um, advantages and common challenges. Um, the outlook generally is positive. I, th I think the medium uh, term outlook um, in terms of growth is actually very positive. It is ab above 4%. Um, but there are challenges. And I can say the challenges in a very brief way are what the challenges that are facing the rest of the world. But in certain areas, it's actually more serious in, in MENA. It's energy security fueled by COVID, post-COVID recovery, um, you know, supply chain uh, challenges. Um, energy security, food security is also another serious problem, again, fueled by the current geopolitical situation. And in this particular area, let us remember that the MENA region is a significant importer of wheat. Uh, and if you look at just some basic figures, we represent about 6% of the world population. And the World Bank is saying 20% of the world's potential starvation, or not really starvation, but really fragile. Food shortages. 20% uh, 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 of it is going to be in the MENA. Um, some countries in MENA import about 90% of their wheat needs um, compared to other regions. Um, but there are a lot of good side, really, uh, uh, potential. There is a young population. There is a lot of um, countries who are really embarking in significant reform. So we need to look at it within that context. Can you give us some uh, expectations for the economic outlook uh, for the growth, expected growth of Saudi Arabia? Oil prices at $100, of course, made it easier. By the way, how much easier is it to do your job with oil at $110? <laughs> It's actually more difficult, Nadine, <laughs> trust me. 
um, <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. But the, the projection for this year is about 7.4 percent and oil and growth. Um, non, um, oil is about 19 percent because we are produ producing. It has, it has nothing to do with the price. It's just the production. Um, so the production will increase. Um, uh, so the GDP will, will be about 19 percent in the oil side. An average non-oil in the midterm will be about 6 percent. Uh, so it's very healthy. Um, confidence is actually very strong and the potential is quite high. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Al Khalifa, Bahrain is another country that is benefiting from the uh, oil revenue windfall to help with the fiscal um, uh, budget. So, can you give us your outlook for Bahrain uh, uh, going forward? Thank you very much, uh, Nadine. It's a pleasure to be here today on this esteemed panel uh, and to be back in uh, Davos after uh, an absence uh, of a while. Uh, high oil prices have the benefit of reducing funding needs. That is uh, absolutely the case. Uh, and we are seeing strong economic growth coming out of uh, COVID. Uh, and that strong economic growth uh, towards the end of 2021 has continued uh, very much and pr pretty much picking up pace through 2022. So we're seeing strong economic growth coming across all sectors. We have a very diversified economy in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Last year, uh, in Q4 of last year, we hit 81% non-oil sectors in the economy. So that diversification means that the broad-based growth that we're seeing coming out of COVID uh, has served us very well. Uh, last year, uh, we also launched our economic recovery plan, uh, where we outlined very clearly uh, uh, with five pillars what we would be doing to, number one, create jobs, number two, simplify procedures for investors, uh, number three, uh, accelerate strategic projects. Number four, focus on priority sectors in the economy that we will be driving. And number five, achieving fiscal balance. Our fiscal balance plans were launched in 2018. We were making significant headway before COVID. Of course, the impact of oil price and of the drop in non-oil activity uh, meant that we had to revise those numbers meant that we had to revisit our fiscal balance plan projections, and now we are aiming to achieve fiscal balance by 2024 at an oil price of $60. And so when it comes to ensuring that we maintain discipline during this time and ensuring that we stay on track, uh, we focus very much on that $60 number because that is the basis that underpins our plans, and we've shown, uh, we've shown absolute discipline in moving forward. Uh, but right now, the break-even price of oil is higher, so can you give us some financial metrics, the expectations for the budget deficit, and so in 2022? In 2022, uh, we're seeing high oil prices reduce that deficit substantially versus plan because oil price is higher than that, mm. uh, and therefore uh, our projected deficits for 2022 in, in our plan were built around $60 a barrel. It's also important to note that our state budget was at $50 a barrel. And now we're achieving uh, triple digit oil sales prices. So we will see a significantly lower deficit in the first half of the year uh, and we'll be well on our way to achieving our targets before year end. Mr. Lard, I'd like to hear from a private sector perspective, how do you see the outlook for the MENA region given the global context of a raging war in Ukraine, inflation and rising interest rates? So, Radin, I think uh, from what uh, the elections have said, I think every investor in the world looks at the Gulf now in particular, and I think uh, a, a big part of the Middle East is the same, as really living the ideal scenario particularly for inflation now. I mean, where in investments, if you can uh, raise prices, expand volume, and not uh, raise cost, is, is really heaven for everyone. Now, this is what the GCC is living in at the moment. But I think it's not, uh, again, like uh, was said before, I don't think the oil price is the only one at the moment, because all these uh, robust and strong visions, uh, great reforms that has happened, is really, I think, setting and positioning the Gulf to the pre-COVID uh, growth. Uh, so uh, we see, we're very optimistic. We see uh, we're uh, deploying capital in the Gulf, and uh, it's a great story. For, for this is the Gulf. What about the wider region? Well, we at InvestCorp uh, concentrate on the Gulf, uh, but uh, obviously, uh, like His Excellency said, you know, there are uh, areas and there are regions of the Egypt uh, and others are really showing... That are vulnerable for the commodity shock. 
and uh, uh, Mr. Bajani, you have also businesses in different countries and uh, you also operate in countries that are oil importing. Um, what keeps you up at night right now? Other than being Everything. Lebanese, Leno, it comes with the nationality. Everything. When you're Lebanese, you don't, speak, <laughs> you don't sleep at night anyway. So, <laughs> Well, look, I think the region, uh, His Excellency Mohammed Jadan said it, <sighs> our, biggest, our biggest lost opportunity is that the MENA region is not a region. And unless we get to a point where this MENA region becomes a region and we can really punch uh, where we should be punching, we're going to continue to be under par. You know, uh, we're, we're uh, launching tomorrow uh, uh, the Majd al Futem report on a regional economic integration. And one of the things uh, that you will find is the fact that the MENA region on average produces half the GDP, the, the average global GDP. So each one of us individually in the MENA region, we actually produce half what an average person in, in the world produces or contributes, which tells uh, you, you a great story about what we are missing in our part of the world. Now, this is not to undermine, I think, or, or to not to emphasize the importance of the fantastic reforms that are happening, whether in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, whether in the UAE. Today, we have two major engines of economic growth that are basically uh, kind of at their best for thanks to the reforms that have been put in place, but also thanks to the outlook that we're seeing and basically the, a bit on the geopolitical fundamentals and especially the, 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 the oil of price, Bahrain and other uh, Qatar, etc. benefit from that, Oman will benefit from it. So there is a bit on the oil importing side, I would say, more uh, uh, headroom, which I think is, is very good. But this is also not only due to the fact that now we are seeing price of oil at this stage. It's also due to the fact that when you look back in the past two years, managing the crisis from a monetary standpoint actually left the region with much better headroom compared to other parts of the world. This is why we're going to have less inflation, although we are a region, going back to MENA, that imports 80% of our food. You know, we import 80, 85% sorry, of our food in the MENA region. So we are an, a huge importer of food. Despite that, we're going to have less inflation in our part of the world because we have central banks and basically uh, regulators that have more tools that are at their disposal compared to elsewhere in the world. And this is something really, it goes to the credit of how this, these two years have been managed in our part of the world. It's not a region that is, I mean, without challenges. I mean, Egypt today is going through a rough patch. Uh, a year ago, two years ago, we were in a very different story. situation. It was a success story. The issue is exactly. that it's, uh, it was very vulnerable to what's going on in the world, and it, it was a Yes, I think time. that it's, it's a combination of, I think what's happening now in the world was a trigger, an additional trigger, but this is not why things are where they are. I think there are more reforms that needs to be done. I think the Egyptian government is very committed to make sure this happens. I think there is an IMF reform that's happening. And I think today we're seeing something which is very encouraging, is, is great, is great uh, commitment from the Gulf uh, producing nations, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE, to actually invest substantial amount of money in the private sector in Egypt and basically kind of contribute to the economy beyond only the, the monetary support that is, is surely surely needed. I think all of that puts us, I would say, uh, paints a very positive picture. But I also think we we owe it to our region. We owe it to the almost uh, 600 million people that live from North Africa all the way to Pakistan to really really work together in order to push this region to reach its economic potential. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned inflation. You did not give us your expectations for inflation. Can you give us uh, that for, for Saudi Arabia for 2022? And I want to ask you about the budget surplus because everybody wants to know how you are going to deploy it. In the first quarter of this year, the budget surplus was more than $15 billion. If oil prices are going to stay at these levels and it's expected that they would, we would end the year with uh, about $55 billion surplus. How will you deploy that surplus? Um, before I respond to this, Nadine, I think it is very important just to know, to close the discussion possibly at the first point, is that I really, really think it is very critical for um, international organizations and multilateral development institutions, including the World Bank, to look at this region very carefully and very quickly. Uh, I think there is, um, you know, there are countries that really, really need support and, and we are working with the IMF, the World Bank. But, you know, using this forum, I would like really to invite uh, everyone to 
take this very seriously and, and um, quickly. Going back to your question, um, uh, inflation in Saudi in the first quarter uh, was about 1.6%. We expect inflation by the end of the year to be around 2.1 to 2.3. Um, uh, and uh, in relation to surplus, thanks to the reform that we have done. I mean, leaving again, people just look at the uh, oil price and believe that what is happening now is just the result of oil price. We had oil prices in Saudi um, above this level. Uh, it is really how we are going to use this, what reform, how the system is prepared uh, to deal with this surplus. Obviously, we are decoupling the economy from oil price. So this fluctuation in oil revenue is not impacting how we are managing our public finance. Um, so uh, as and when surplus materializes end of this year, because we, it's not really quarterly, our budget is yearly, then we will be looking at the allocation based on Vision 2030 program that is clearly established for public finance, which is the fiscal a sustainability program which sets clear fiscal rules on how to allocate the surplus between you know deposits pif ndf that's and my others. question uh, the vision focuses on diversifying the economy through the pif it is a main vehicle for doing that so are one there of, one of them one of the main vehicles yes. is there uh, a plan to uh, transfer some funds to the pif right now i think there is no immediate plan to transfer any funds to pi pf has actually ample liquidity uh, the question would come at the first quarter of next year when we have actually the surplus yeah. from this year is how where are we going to allocate it and it's basically where is the most positive impact on the economy going to come from we have the ndf which is a very important institution that supports private sector investment and private sector participation in the economy is a Vision 2030 priority. So we need to make sure that we allocate um, uh, enough uh, amount of money to them. We have opportunities to invest with PIF because they are actually making very good deals in their investments and, and uh, doing very well, both in, inside Saudi and outside. And then you need to look at you know, your reserves. Uh, is there a potential medium term external shocks that you need to build more reserves or more what you have now is enough? Your Excellency, just a follow-up question. When oil prices are high, there's a certain level of expectation among the people for uh, a more relaxed approach to austerity, which was in place not a long time ago because oil prices went up very quickly. Um, so how are you going to balance between, on one hand, limiting the impact of inflation on people, uh, on the other hand, uh, not relaxing the reform programs or do you plan on re relaxing them? I think the fundamental part is making sure that you have a social safety net that takes care of the most vulnerable within the society. So instead of actually having subsidies distributed to everyone and which in a lot of way will go to the most rich because they have the bigger houses, the bigger cars, they consume more fuel, more energy, that is not fair. So you need to direct your support to those who are in need and we have the citizens account program, which is designed to do that exactly. Uh, we are very clear on our determination to continue on our reforms. Um, we started dealing with inflation actually early on. If you remember, in, uh, yeah. towards the end of last year, we, we froze the price escalation of gasoline uh, for the internal economy and the households so at, at $70. So anything above $70, the economy will not feel that heat. That is helping. You could see it in the inflation in Saudi because if you let the uh, energy to go up at the current levels, you would have seen the inflation a lot higher. So mm -hmm. that is one reason why the inflation is low because you capped um, the energy uh, part of the inflation. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Al Khalifa Bahrain had its own reform program in 2018, and then you tweaked that program in 2021. So, again, is there pressure now with the current prices to relax on reforms? And how do you manage between maintaining growth and managing inflation? Uh, I'll start by saying you always solve for growth, and you should always solve for growth, because sustainable growth is what we should be delivering. Uh, inflationary pressures have to be managed, but you, we should not compromise 
the drive uh, to deliver sustainable growth uh, anytime. And any historical efforts to try and do that, to try and slow down growth on purpose, um, the results are in the history books. Uh, and, and when we're going through our, our programs today, and His Excellency Minister Al Jad'an mentioned earlier, let us not underestimate the work that has been done on increasing non oil revenues. And today, the increase in oil prices has maybe masked the amount of effort and the amount of results that have been delivered by that mm -hmm. increase. I can talk about Bahrain's numbers. Uh, if we look since 2018, we have we will be on course to have more than tripled non-oil revenue by the end of this year. That, that's significant. Yeah, the oil price increase maybe masks the amount of work that has been done. And more importantly, which is an extremely important point that maybe was missed in a lot of reform processes in the past, and we can see it very much in the thinking in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the efforts that we're doing in Bahrain, is the correlation of the fiscal position to economic growth. This is something that was overlooked in many previous cycles. And when I say that, I mean when you look at revenue items that you add into a budget, what is their, they have to be positively correlated to economic growth. Then those become more sustainable. And if you look at expenditure items, they should not be positively correlated to economic growth. And therefore, we are not driving austerity programs. And I can tell you in the fiscal balance program of the Kingdom of Bahrain, it is not an austerity program. Mm -hmm. It is a readjustment program. And that readjustment program will readjust the balance of revenues and expenditures while maintaining the growth trajectory of the economy. That's what's important to do. Um, Mr. Lade, we're hearing of the different reform uh, programs and diversification programs that have been happening all over the Gulf. Do you think that this creates opportunities for a company like you that, uh, and, and not any, I would of course like to hear about the investment opportunities, but also opportunities that are good for the bottom line, but also help with that diversification drive? No, for sure. I mean, uh, to uh, His Excellency, uh, a comment about uh, Bahrain. We lived through the pandemic in Bahrain. And I must say, you know, how it was managed, we felt safe uh, to go to our offices, uh, leave if we want, come back if we want, more than any other office in any other geography that we've had in the world. And so this is really a testament to how, uh, you know, the government in Bahrain has really uh, taken that. Uh, in all the GCC, one has to admit, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, it was also for sure. the but same. Absolutely. And absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. For sure. I mean, the whole of the, yeah. I think the GCC comes out of it with really robust vaccination uh, success. I think the reforms, obviously every country has its visions and has its uh, reforms. But I think the thing that you see now with, the, with these re reforms, that there is a really strong uh, will to ensure that these governments don't do all this by themselves because they can't, so they really want the private sector to take part of it. And so we see a very strong uh, PPP programs, which is really good. I think the other thing, there is also a great focus on expanding the private sector, which is really good. And, uh, and, and you see that with capital markets, you see that with the exchanges, uh, reform, uh, business, business environment. In terms of what we see as uh, uh, as opportunities, we see a lot of opportunities. I mean, we have uh, we have an infrastructure fund uh, to to deploy in the in the region. We have a pre-IPO fund to deploy in the region. We uh, we've uh, uh, started uh, a blockchain uh, investment fund. Uh, uh, so yeah, we there's there's a lot uh, that we see there. I might go back and ask you about the interesting sectors as well. Uh, Mr. Bajani, I would like to ask you about the retail operations. You run massive retail operations all over the region. And now with inflation, I would like to hear from you how much has the cost of inventory increased? How much have you been able to pass that through to the final consumer? Can you give us a feel of how is it to be in that sector right now with the current increase in, uh, in prices? Well, it's unlike uh, His Excellency Jadan's job. It's exactly the opposite. The opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've been <laughs> we've been we've been fighting, passing through, I would say, inflationary costs for the past nine months at least. 
And I think we are at a point in time where this is not possible anymore because the, it's huge. Give me an average. And on average, I'm not going to give you an average because there are no averages. <laughs> I mean, different countries, different markets have different realities. <laughs> and I don't want us to basically just generalize. The realities are different. What I, what I would like to say is we are today in a situation whereby we're going to see much less if inflationary uh, costs uh, passing through for example, in, in economies like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc., where there has been and there is continue to be tools to deal with that. Elsewhere, it's going to be different. You see already government capping prices at, at the retail level, which is understandable uh, from a social standpoint, but there has to be solutions. And I, I second the appeal of His Excellency about bringing in the IFIs as early as possible to deal with some of the issues that we are uh, that we are living through, this is not a region's issue. This is a global issue. Of course, we have structural structural imbalances that you need to to address. And what I would say is that I would urge and second both their excellencies' drive to actually keep the reforms in place, not to loosen up uh, early enough, and also to make sure that we get to a point where we actually have headroom for the future, because this is not the last issue. The impact of the Russia-Ukraine war is certainly real but it is not what causes most of the inflationary pressure that we are seeing today. Uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, of course, when prices increase, it hits demand. Have you seen uh, a decline in demand and in purchasing power in any of the countries where you are uh, operating in today? Certainly. We are seeing uh, a much more, uh, I would say, value-conscious customer mm. because of the inflationary pressures, definitely. And it is something that is going to become more and more, uh, more and more of an issue in the coming in the coming months and years, depending how the geopolitical situation evolves, and depending actually where we're going to end up in terms of solutions to the problems that we are facing today. A big question mark today, no one has an answer, is how much is going to be the impact of basically uh, of production and supply chain on, on production and supply chain of grains. You know that Russia produ I mean, exports not only grains or wheat, etc., for 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 bread and other. Uh, or uh, I mean, uh, consumables, but also for I mean, for the fertilizer cost, also for uh, uh, feed, livestock, livestock feed, yeah. etc. So all of these things are going to have a big impact on other products that are not today included in the what we call the bread basket. So it depends how things evolve. Are we going to be able in Europe to actually strike a deal in order to keep some of this grain flowing or not? Uh, and what are the solutions that some of the countries that have potential that can step in in order to put more stock on the market, do it or not, depend, not only depending on the price, also. but actually I, the cost can be managed, if, but the supply is actually, is actually very important. Let's take a few questions from the audience. If you have a question, just give me a sign and if possible, please stand up for the camera purposes. Are there any questions? Please, uh, can we pass on a microphone? And please, if you can just uh, stand up and tell us your name and the question. Hi, Hala al from Bahrain. Uh, I wanted to ask to al fatim because he said he felt the pressure of the uh, um, people having less purchasing power. How has that reflected in their relationship with tenants and has that reflected in any way? So, you know, Majid al fatim we always have great relationship with our tenants and we're always very happy about that because we are very much cautious when it gets to uh, what we call uh, our basically OCR, so make sure that the pressure on tenants' occupancy cost continue to be within what's acceptable for our tenants from a top-line standpoint. So this is something that actually is a policy across our portfolio of shopping malls, and this is why, if you look at our performance compared to other UCS with higher, with higher occupancies and less, uh, and less uh, occupancy cost. Uh, we have a question there. Yeah, I'm Carlin Taylor from FTI Consulting, and I wanted to ask His Excellency uh, about the NEOM project and how you view that in Saudi Arabia and how the kingdom views uh, the expenditure going on there and the success. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, Saudi, uh, which is my... Uh, direct domain, there is a lot that is happening, including in the financial technology. We have licensed three uh, digital banks only in the last few months. Um, uh, these are fundamentally changing uh, the landscape. Um, uh, we have uh, 
few um, uh, technology companies that have received their final licenses, and we have tens of them in the, in the sandbox um, environment. Um, uh, that is part of you know, what we are doing to develop the financial sector. Actually, if I may, I will use this opportunity to say, actually, we are announcing today that... <coughs> Uh, Arab News reported that uh, the WEF might, uh, is looking at Saudi Arabia for having the regional conferences there. Is there anything material uh, about that that you can tell I us? I mean, we will, it will be announced when it is done, but um, there is discussions all the time. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Larabi, can you repeat in a concise way because they couldn't hear you uh, on the live streaming, so I'm not sure if the mic is on. There you go. I'll start okay. Very briefly. Uh, the wider region, we always say there's opportunity if only there was more stability in, in some countries um, of the region. So I wanted to ask you where you see points of opportunity despite instability in the region at a time that we're seeing good growth, um, particularly in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and others. To whom is the question? Um, ideally, Sheikh Salman and His Excellency Minister Jadan. Sheikh Salman. Uh, one of the main things, Amina, that we've seen recently with, with uh, technology and the developments in technology and how they've enabled uh, many people uh, in terms of their economic productivity becomes very key in terms of where the opportunities are lying forward. So there have been big advances maybe in the GCC economies that you've seen with regards to building economies of creativity and ideas, uh, which, are, which, are, which are transformational in terms of the economic value added versus having a factory with a job that you show up in in the morning and the economic activity that is associated with that. But uh, the economic output um, of creativity and of ideas that results in real economic value added means that we have to empower and enable that across the region. So yes, there are big challenges economically when we look at the wider region. But when you look at where the human resources are, and when you're talking about an economic, uh, an, an economy built on creativity and ideas, then you need to be focused on investing in that human capital. And yes, there have been many initiatives in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in Bahrain, that has focused on empowering individuals and investing in them in recognition of the fact that you can now add value into the economy purely by having a good idea. <coughs> this is very different to the way that economic planning used to be done before. And that same economic planning and same empowerment mechanisms and tools that have been deployed maybe on a wider basis within the Gulf. For example, I'll give Bahrain's example. The setup of the Temkin Fund, which collected the labor fees that were being, uh, uh, that, that were put on, and then distributed them to Bahrainis for upskilling, for training programs, and for st starting new ventures, has covered over 85% of Bahrainis working in the economy. Yes, it's a small economy, but when you look at the breadth that it has covered, right? So then you take that, those kind of models, you scale them up in regions with larger population centers, and you start seeing that the opportunity is tied to where the people are, and you start investing that way. Uh, Mr. Jadan, very briefly, because we need to take some more questions. I think it is the youth, and it is technology, and I would just suggest um, for brevity is that you visit MISC uh, Youth Majlis. I went there yesterday, and I'm sure you will get out a lot more optimistic about the region. And I, and I went there today, and I, and I urge everybody to visit. It's fantastic. You're just telling us about what an experience it was to listen to these young people exchanging ideas. Uh, there's a question there. Uh, hello, uh, Ali Ahmed from Arab News. Um, this question is for the, their excellencies and Mr. Bijani. Uh, the Lebanese elections just wrapped up. Any hope? And what type of uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what type of financial remedies do you really suggest for the country in such a time? <laughs> Thank you. Very quickly, Tfadal, Mr. Jan. Um, 
obviously we we really really um, wish uh, the Lebanese people all the best and and we really care about Lebanese people I mean we host in our country thousands and thousands of them um, and a lot of them actually you know, in, in prominent positions so uh, we want to see the best for Lebanon but then we can't act uh, as Lebanese it is the Lebanese who will need to act uh, and I think um, as and when we see a serious government that is really uh, going to take care of the people of Lebanon, we will act. We have been hysterically, and there is no reason why we would not come to support. So you're not involved in the current formation of uh, a government after the change that is happening and <laughs> the result of the elections? I mean, I'm, I, the last I checked, I'm, I'm not <laughs> Lebanese, so... <Okay. laughs> Uh, last question, Mr. Tomari, and then I have a few questions. I would like some brief answers. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Mohamed Tamalia, a global shaper from the Jeddah Hub, representing the, the part of the delegation representing the youth voice at Davos. My question is for Your Excellency Ahmed um, Jadan. Um, uh, in terms of the capital markets and also in Bahrain, the how I mean, capital markets have grown significantly in Saudi with it being institutionalized and uh, put on the global stage. How did you see the role of the capital markets in creating value for the economy, driving as part of the vision, the growth in Saudi Arabia? And how do you see the outlook for the capital markets uh, going forward? And for Mr. Raudi, just one more question, please, as well. Uh, given your Invest Corp and the number of companies that were spin off into the, that were spinned off into the Saudi market, how do you see that value creation that was created for these companies, uh, three or four companies in Saudi? And what are the preferred sectors that you have uh, in Saudi and GCC specifically. Thank you very much for your time. Very quickly, I think I can tell you that uh, capital market plays a significant role in supporting growth. Uh, so it provides funding for um, investors, including uh, small and medium enterprises. We have seen in Saudi the largest number of IBOs um, uh, last year. Uh, a lot of them were small businesses, um, uh, so that is actually providing that uh, financing needs. Uh, the same goes with the debt uh, capital market. I think the potential is very high, um, uh, and the growth um, prospects uh, would require a very strong and robust capital market. Uh, Mr. Laadi, I'd like to hear your answer to this question, but also I want to ask you about the role of capital markets. Normally, they should play a role in fueling, being the engine of, uh, to fuel growth. Do you see them playing that role in uh, the GCC, given the, the really the big increase that happened in the past couple of years, yeah, no, until, for, up until the crash of Wall Street? For, thank you, Andin. For sure. I mean, stock exchanges and capital markets are really the heart of the economy, and uh, this is how they should be looked at. If, if we can... Uh, really upgrade them, uh, bring liquidity, uh, bring uh, public offerings. Uh, it just distributes uh, wealth, it creates wealth, it, it, does, every, uh, it, it, uh, it does everything we, you need for uh, a growing economy. You mentioned, uh, you know, Tadawal. Tadawal is, is, is fantastic for us. We have put five companies uh, in Tadawal. To just give you a, a, an example, last year we we put one of the companies in there, and I think we were after something like $200 million. It was oversubscribed by something like $6 billion, and it was all local money. There was no hedge funds from here and there. There was no institutions from America, and which tells you the real potential that, that there is in the, in the GCC. Now, I, I think there are uh, some governments that are really giving uh, it focus more than other governments, which I think... Uh, you know, again, to Elaine's uh, uh, point about the, the whole region needs to pull in this because there's just so much potential uh, in it, uh, and we shouldn't really lose this uh, this opportunity. Uh, the sectors we, uh, uh, you know, we we really like strong companies that are uh, that have uh, you know strong shareholders uh, uh, that uh, you know they have a path for. Uh, 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 you know, to grow and uh, uh, and have a path for uh, for exit. Uh, we've done uh, you know everything. I think to do with the consumers, uh, tech enabled uh, services, uh, uh, and now obviously we, like I said, we are into infrastructure, uh, pre IPOs, and 
even blockchain. Mr. Lardy, what happened to the AC Milan deal? Ah. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, I want to congratulate AC Milan on the big victory last night. I think that was good. Obviously, for legal and regulatory reasons, I can't say much than that. But uh, what I would say is that uh, AC Milan is a, a great club. But what is the situation now? Are you still considering uh, buying the team? or wh wh Where do we stand today? So the situation is that we are really very interested in the, the industry of sports. We want to invest in it. Uh, we see a lot of opportunity in the European footballs. Uh, it's still behind the United States in, in terms of leveraging on, on that. Uh, and I would really leave it at that at the moment. Okay. Uh, Sheikh Salman, uh, there is uh, immense pressure on governments to invest in a greener future, and especially for oil exporting countries. Uh, I'm sure, I know that most uh, GCC countries are doing a lot in terms of the energy transition. Uh, can you tell us what are your plans in that space? Th thank you for, for, for that, Nadine. And, uh, you know, if you look at the technology revolution or what we call the technology revolution, was really very focused on the generation, transmission, and consumption of data. That's what changed fundamentally in the technology revolution. And when we're looking forward and we said, saying to ourselves, what will fundamentally change in five years' time, 10 years' time? What will be fundamentally different in 20 years' time? Uh, we've, we've really you know, grown attached to the idea that the way that we generate, transmit, and consume energy will be what will be trans in a completely transformationally different. Uh, and, and that's why looking at investing in technology in the energy space uh, means that we have to look at localized solutions, localized generation, localized consumption, uh, and really build and invest in that way for a sustainable future. But this doesn't happen overnight. This happens over uh, decades. And during that process, we should not lose sight of what is our main source generation. And that's something everybody in the world needs to continue to focus on. You have to plan this over a two-decade cycle. It Especially cannot happen today, by next year. Especially with the, today with the energy uh, situation. Mr. Jadan, uh, I think our time is out. I'd like to finish with a question um, in the same uh, area. There are so many initiatives that Saudi Arabia had announced that could have a spillover effect on the MENA region. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? I mean, one of them is actually related to your question, which is the um, Saudi Green Initiative. Exactly. And with it, we also announced the uh, Middle East Green Initiative, which basically is a, a regional um, platform that will bring about the, the, the um, experience that we have gone through. We have invested already uh, for the uh, past few years on, on um, reducing emissions, uh, on renewables, on uh, new technologies. Uh, we. Uh, uh, put forward under our G20 presidency, the circular carbon economy. So we have a lot of ideas that actually the, mid, the Middle East at large can benefit from and we will work with them to make sure that we have a greener future, uh, less uh, emission and using technologies without actually being too aggressive and uh, going into actually serious uh, energy security challenges that we are facing today. My worry is people Today, have a lot of attention about um, you know energy security just because uh, you have the gas at 500 percent more than um, just a year ago, um, and the problem with that is now we are burning in Europe and other parts the dirtiest coal. Exactly, uh, and that is a serious problem. I think we need to be wise about the transition. We need to make sure that we are serious about our climate change uh, targets, but at the same time. It is targets that will happen in 2050, 2030, 2040, or 2060, not today. So today you need fossil fuel. You need to work on technologies to reduce emission, and you need to invest on your journey for the green by 2050 uh, or 2040. On that note, we're going to end the panel. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us on the panel and for everyone who joined. Thank you very much. I hope you found it informative and enjoyable. Thank you.